All right. Thanks, Phil. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Perfect. So, uh, hi. At Twilio, we have a saying, and that saying is, every communication counts. And what we mean by that is that we can't know ahead of time whether you're sending a text message to somebody to tell them their credit card bill is late, or as we saw this morning, we're handling somebody who's in crisis and needs help immediately. So we have to treat everything with the utmost importance. Sometimes, more so in the past than today, uh, we, haven't, we haven't lived up to our own expectations or yours. Uh, for example, the Twilio API in 2013 had 99.5% uptime. And as Jeff said, there are some companies out there who might say, hey, two nines, that's great. That's not us. We aren't happy with that. What I'm here to talk to you today about is the history of the API and the deep architectural change we've made to make the API more reliable than ever before because every communication counts. So with that in mind, oh, totally burned a slide there. Hi, I'm Sam. I worked on this. <laughs> I've been with Twilio for three years. Uh, first two of those were on the API team. They were great. I'm working on data storage now, but I still love my friends on the API, and I'm here to tell you about all the great work we did in those two years. We had an intense focus on reliability and scalability during that time. And today I'm going to go through the history of the API, where it started, there's a deep history, we're going to go seven years back, uh, where it is today, and what we've changed to deliver even higher availability today. First off, let's start by defining availability. Everybody measures this differently, and I think it's important for us to be on the same page so we can all know what I mean when I say that the API has uptime. So the Twilio API, as you might know, serves a lot of functions. These are just a few. API team and the rest of Twilio engineering have put some thought into this, and what we've decided is that the best definition for the API's availability is, can the API satisfy requests even if one or more resources might be temporarily degraded? So to kind of put a picture on this, Let's say everything's up, everybody's happy. And then because, as we know, failure happens, we temporarily lose, let's say, one of the databases powering the calls list endpoint. So now somebody wants to get requests or list out their calls and they're unhappy a little bit, but you can see on our status page that the specific resource is degraded. And the rest of the API is still working. Somebody comes along and wants to send a message, they're doing fine. Twilio API team has defined this as the API is available, and this lets us focus on the reliability of the API infrastructure without worrying about every single product that we power through it. It lets us provide fine-grained status updates to you, because we don't want to cry wolf and say the entire API is broken when it's just one resource, something that you might not be using. You'd stop, pay, you'd stop paying attention to our alerts, right? And finally, it lets the product teams that we expose through the API take ownership of their own systems and focus on their availability and define it in the, best, the way that's best for them. So with that definition in mind, let's put some numbers up. Here's 2013. The peak traffic to the API was 1,000 requests per second. And like I said, we had two and a half nines, 99.5% availability. Things have changed a little bit. Here's today. Five times the traffic, 5,000 requests per second at peak. And I'm pleased to report that at the end of 2015, for the year, we hit 99.9994% uptime. That's five nines. And in there, hidden that number. Thank you. Hidden inside that number is an even better one. We had two entire quarters of 100% uptime. The API layer did not induce a single failed request that we could have served internally. As we all know, as Bruce has talked about, as Jeff has talked about, failure happens. This wasn't luck, this was engineering. API team worked really hard for those two years to rebuild the entire API platform from the ground up, decouple unrelated systems from each other, and migrated every API resource from one architecture to the other without inducing additional downtime. I was expecting a face mic, this is not enough hands. Uh, let's go into the architectures in some more detail. So, past and present. The API we started with, as a brittle architecture, was forced on us by legacy code and design. It had grown organically and really wasn't keeping up with what we needed to do for ourselves and for you. As of today, through careful planning and hard work, we've shrugged off that burden of technical debt. And the current platform is deliberately engineered for composability, rapid evolution, and scale. So. Long, long ago in the deep past, Twilio version 1, seven years ago. Raise your hand if you were here then. Were you using Twilio seven years ago? One, two, 
All right, thanks for being with us for so long. And that's Barat, I'm just trolling me. Knock it off. <laughs> uh, thank you for being with us. And I'm really happy to report that things have changed a lot. So let's go into this. Seven years ago, this is basically what Twilio looked like. It was voice only, SMS wasn't in the picture yet. And kind of on one side of the world, we had Twilio Voice. This was a Java service that implemented Twimmel and our connections to the carriers and everything that you know and love today as the Twilio Voice product. And on the other side of the system, we had PHP. PHP powered the API, the website, our billing systems, and pretty much everything else. They communicated by means of a shared database. And so the flow through this went something like this. You'd make a post request to the calls endpoint to send a new call out. API would validate your request, authenticate it, make sure everything checked out, and say, hey, great, new call to send. Drops a row into the calls table. And then on the other side of the world, we have Java that's pulling for new calls, things that are in queued, picks them up, makes phone calls, writes status updates back to the database, and then you can send your get requests, and the API layer would just read from that database and hand you back your results. This was easy. Then SMS came along a little bit later. And we'd learned something about queues by then. Uh, turns out MySQL is not a good one. Don't do that. So outbound messages, we wanted to handle the queue separately. We had a separate internal system for doing that. And so the API knew, knew how to speak HTTP to that internal service. And so your outbound messages went that way. And then retrieving your message list still went directly to the database. And this is more or less how things went for several years. We'd add a new feature. We'd just jam some logic into the PHP API implementation and call it a day. There were a couple of things that were good about this. First off, we had a single implementation for all the common elements of those API endpoints. So things like authentication, validation, formatting, and the data model. So in particular with the data model, building the website was easy, right? We already have our database connection, our object definitions, slap a new controller on it, write some HTML, and you've got a website. Then there were also some things that weren't so great. In particular, I had one major flaw. The workloads for all these API endpoints were incredibly varied. In queuing a call, sending a new message comes back in a few milliseconds in the happy case. That's great. Reading 1,000 messages filtered on the sender, fil filtered on the recipient, filtered with the date sent, uh, pulling out the internal data from the database that you didn't care about and then serializing everything might take a bit longer. So the core problem here was one of inefficient resource utilization. We started to deploy HTTP services internally, as I said. So some endpoints in this new model where the API gets a request from you and it does some work and then sends a request off to an internal service. And then others still did SQL. Uh, making a database connection, it's just TCP or load balancer layer, HA proxy. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a really good way to look inside what's going on inside of my SQL socket. Can't figure out whether your queries are taking too long or not working at all. So our load balancing layer had limited opportunity to be able to isolate failing systems. And worse, the API was deployed as a single service handling all those requests. So we had a shared worker pool and a shared request queue. And finally, because PHP, until very recently, didn't have a good story for doing asynchronous I.O., we were running with synchronous sockets. So a quick refresher, synchronous I.O. means that every time you need to make a network call, the thread that's handling the request just blocks. You can't do anything else with it. So that core is just tied up waiting for those results to come back. It looked like so this. So under the PHP architecture, we had this fixed size pool of workers plus a request queue. And then when a request came in and we did some I.O., we'd have to wait for it. And the worker process, right? So this worker process here can't go pick up another task, can't handle any other requests while we're waiting for that result to come back. And then there we go. More requests happen. And then if we use up all the workers, we can't take any more requests until something returns, right? So the queue's blocked. This isn't ideal, and I bet some of you who've dealt with similar things can guess what's going to come next. We've got these many endpoints with this single service, a single code base, and synchronous workers. This wasn't a good recipe for success. It lacked fault isolation. We weren't able to efficiently use our resources, and so starvation happened. Back in those days, the API used to fail in a really common pattern. Uh, let's say failure happens, a hardware failure happens, and one of our SMS database primaries goes down. Bye, database. So requests start timing out, trying to retrieve data from that, right? Lots of requests start timing out. And then we've got these fixed depth pool of workers, synchronous I.O. We can't do anything else. We're waiting for those to come back. It takes 30 seconds for the socket to time out. And we starve the rest of the API requests for resources. The whole API can't handle requests, even completely unrelated ones, right? So your, cars, your calls for the 
calls endpoints start failing, your usage requests start failing. This, this is the picture we want, right? Well, in this mode, when we hit this failure scenario, here's what actually happens. API is down. We usually spent more time doing restarts of the API hosts to clear out those worker backlogs. And it took us to actually pivot and promote a new database. So it wasn't what we wanted, and obviously we knew it wasn't what you wanted as our customers. When we set out to fix this, it was really obvious which pieces we wanted to keep and which ones we wanted to improve on. Let's go through those. We wanted to keep that single implementation of common concerns and the rapid development that it enabled. And we wanted to fix the resource utilization and fault isolation problems. Fortunately, API team wasn't in a vacuum here. Solo engineering had been moving on. We'd taken those few monolithic stacks that I talked about, the SMS stack, the voice stack, and decomposed them into standalone services. A single service to handle sending a message, fetching a message, fetching a call, changing your uh, settings on the applications, and so on. So everything's taken apart. We have the individual services. And we settled on all these services running, working together, and everything speaks REST internally. So we started thinking, hey, we've got all these REST APIs inside the company that we've re-implemented all this functionality in. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just take that and put a bow on it and make that our public API? Yeah, we thought so too. Welcome to the next generation of the Twilio API. We call it Starship. Starship is a Python-based HTTP REST proxy that federates all those unique services into a unified public API. It has a single workload. Your API requests, HTTP, come in, and we make internal REST requests. More HTTP goes out. The architecture looks a little bit like this. This is pretty simplified, but gives you an idea. Starship's the front door to the Twilio API. We take the public API requests, transform them to meet the requirements of our internal services, and route them. And wait for the response to come back, and we hand it back to you. So it looks something like this, right? We authenticate, and we apply rate limiting, validation, change it to kind of fix the impedance mismatch, hand it off to the internal service, get the response back, and then serialize it out and send you the response. So we keep that single implementation, that biggest advantage that we had in the original API implementation. Before I dive into how we fix the reliability issues, I'm going to talk through a couple of the other advantages we get out of this architecture. Namely, it's really great from an operational perspective. It's a single place to instrument and manage our API traffic. It's really valuable for monitoring and operations. Here's a couple examples. This is a latency chart of all the resources in the API grouped by which internal system handles them. So each line on here represents how long it took our internal system to handle a particular type of request. So you can look at this and say, this is just one hour's worth of data, but we can look at this in the longer term and look at trends. We can spot problems before they become outages. And similarly, here's a single endpoint broken out by the phase of the request inside Starship. So we've got the authentication phase, the uh, concurrency monitoring phase, the outbound phase, so the, the downstream, how long it takes us to actually handle the request on the internal service. And we've got timers around every single one of those. Right? So on this graph, uh, the spike on the right here uh, is just seasonal traffic causing us to get a little hotter than usual. But uh, you probably can't see the numbers that top right or the top left there, that chart, that line that's not touching is still a tenth of a second. Uh, so this is all completely within normal limits. Um, but we might also see on a graph like this that we deploy the authentication service, let's say, and all of a sudden that line might start spiking or sloping up, right? And we'd be able to say, hey, authentication got slow. We're slowing the API down. What changed? Both of these metrics, we had absolutely no idea before. This is incredible. Like, we are immensely empowered by this, and it's really great. It means we can respond to concerns before they ever affect you. And it gave us even more flexibility and speed on the development side of things than we had before. I don't know if anybody caught Carlos's talk yesterday on kind of how we auto-generate the helper libraries and now auto-generate the API resources, but Starship internally works as a framework. It abstracts away that heavy lifting of doing all the work of validating and transforming and sending on the internal request. So to, do, to add a new API resource, you just have to write out a JSON file that declares what the internal service is, what the data types are, and what the paths for the request are. And you ship that off and reload the API. The deployment is super fast. With this, API team provides extremely fast and responsive service to the rest of Twilio engineering. It takes less than a day to roll out a new API resource for everybody. Starship is the primary tool here. It also gives us operational flexibility. So that architecture with 
unique individual services for every endpoint, let's just scale each product's resources independently to meet your demand. It lets us enable, enables us to use the most efficient uh, usage of our resources. And finally, it gives us really great control for change management. So with Starship in the, in the front of the API, we can actually replace entire backends. We can say, hey, start rolling this service out, and it's going to start handling this request from now on. We even have a shadow mode, so dark deployments built into Starship. So we can say, here's the new one, here's the old one, put them side by side, fork the requests, compare the results, and then if it fails, don't send you the new result. Send you the old one we know is good, and make a note of it so we can go fix that bug before we actually fully deploy. So, all right. Now I'll talk about the performance issues. That unified workload, Starship only speaks HTTP. It's really easy for us to reason about that. Everything's doing the same thing. HTTP is super easy for HAProxy to reason about. We have advanced load balancing and failure detection, right? HAProxy can watch those HTTP responses coming back from the internal service and say, oh, that's a lot of 500s. Let's kick that out. Let's go on. Let's uh, start failing fast until we wait for that to come back up. And we went to Python. So Python has myriad options for doing asynchronous I.O. in deploying web services. And event loops, I'll talk through this uh, in more detail next, uh, event loops support much, much, much deeper queues than those synchronous thread pools we had at first. So the result of those changes is much better resource utilization and fault isolation. So under Starship, we still have our request queue, but we're doing asynchronous I.O., right? So request comes in. We make a request to the internal service, and we just kind of put a timer on it, right? Not even a timer. We put it on the event loop, and we say, call me back when this finishes. And then we yield. We let other requests continue flowing. The I.O. returns. The event loop picks us back up, and we finish handling, and you get your response. And instead of the entire process image, I forgot to point that out earlier, um, in, in the synchronous world, right, we had a heavyweight process for every PHP worker that was handling it. So we could only fit you know, a couple dozen hosts, or sorry, a couple dozen workers on one host because of memory constraints. Now, instead of an entire process image, it's just a stack frame, right? It's a few kilobytes. So a single API host, instead of a couple dozen requests in flight, thousands, right? That queue is much deeper. So everything looks great, right? That second request handles effectively in parallel with the first one while it's waiting on I.O. And so let's revisit that failure scenario that I went through earlier. Say that hardware failure happens and we lose one of our databases. The requests to that service start to slow down or fail. But asynchronous I.O. gives us a deep buffer for those slow requests so we can handle that failure while we wait for the HA proxy load balancing layer to pick it up and say, great, we're failing. Let's cut this off. We'll fail fast until it comes back. And then on-call responds, promotes a replacement database in a couple seconds, and everything's back to normal. And everybody, hopefully you, is much happier. That's pretty much all I've got. So to recap, the early version of the Twilio API, we were great at rapid development and not so great at scaling and multi-tenancy. We honestly had trouble keeping up with you. This is a good problem to have. I'm glad it wasn't the other way around. Uh, and it took us some deep architectural changes to decompose those monolithic stacks into lightweight, independently scalable internal services, and then bind them together with a powerful Starship proxy layer. We migrated from our mixed workload and heavy processes with synchronous I.O. to asynchronous I.O. scheduling, uniform HTTP only, and we're much more resilient to slowdowns and failures. The Twilio API, as a result of all this work, now has the power to scale with you and meet every demand you place on us with the highest reliability because every communication counts. Thank you. I think uh, I'll take questions outside.